this is a traditional traditional fish fry with fried fish, hush puppies, baked bean, and coleslaw. Next thing. Setting up, there'd be pens in different locations all over the county and stuff where they would work with cattle. So we did a little fire pit and hung a little bacon off of a stick right there. They had their other pots and pans. Usually they carried their uh, provisions inside the saddlebags, which are hanging over on the fence. And some more chaps, and then there's some branding irons that they used to do in the um, open range. They'd rope them. And then they'd throw them and then go ahead and pull a Brandon iron out of a place right there and brand them that way. But now they do it all in the pens. And actually, now they don't ever brand anymore. Very seldom. Now they put ear tags in them. And then uh, there was a medicine equipment over there that they used to warm them with. And it evolved from those to the hook kind that made it a little easier to get it in there. And now you just vaccinate them with a needle right on top as they come through and you don't have to worry about all that. So we have the bobcat and the wild hog head over there, and then we have a turtle shells, and there's a board with my children's brands on them. When each one was born, the Carlton tradition was to start a herd for every kid, every child that we had, just like they did for them three generations ago. And now they've gone to college off of that. <laughs> so, put the money in the bank for them, and now they're spending it somewhere else. So, it's all being recycled. And then that was just usually the stuff a guy would do on his bedroll. That he would have a Bible, probably a little whiskey bottle there. And he's got some binoculars and some shell casings and another small pack that he would put on the front of the saddle. And then a pair of spurs and boots, and all the necessities of Lariat. So... They would set up and then sleep on the ground, and they were tough. And then the pictures over there are the first block building built in St. Lucie County. And it is actually Rossler's. It's still standing. And that was built in 1894 by my great-grandfather and his brother who are in the picture. Where, where does it stand, sir? Did you say that? That building on the corner of, in Orange, second in Orange, is that building. It hadn't been torn down. They just built over it and refaced it and stuff like that. But that and you can see there wasn't anything around it. <laughs> Nothing around it. And then later on they did uh, planks down for the sidewalk because everything was horse and buggy through here. So they had wooden planks, just like in the old movies and everything like that. And then further down the street, um, there's a memorial of the plaque the first sheriff elected in St. Louis County was assassinated. And that was my great-grandfather's brother, Dan Carlton. And there's a story of it right there, and then there's a story of the buckhorn there. And so this is just trying to show everybody, you know, what you had, and if you see, what you didn't have. So, you know, the, the pioneer spirit, and then those women that are all up there, were my relatives that lived out on Ten Mile. And the one lady that's inside there owned all the property where Peter P. Cobb's store is, and then further north, and she sold a section of it, or not a full section, but a piece of it, to Annie Hogg, who built her store. And then it became a canning factory after that in the late 1800s. Then they didn't want to be down here because of the mosquitoes and the bugs and everything. So they told the people that the oysters had all dried up. There weren't any more down here to can. 
and they were canning pineapples too, and then they just went back to New Haven, and then Cobb took over because he had worked for Annie Hogg, then he worked for them, and then he bought the store, and it became what it is today. So the women were just as much in the property as the men were back then, believe it or not. And they were probably just as tough, if not tougher, than the men too. <laughs> Men must have been good liars to convince them to come over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> they would usually notch the top of it off, and you can take a fire and light it right on the end of it, and that lighter would, when you break it up right away, it's got turpentine that runs through it. So even if you were in the rain, you could have a fire started. You'd start it with that and you wouldn't cook on it because there's so much soot that comes off of it, but then you'd throw your oak on top of it and get it going. But that was your torch if you needed it right inside there. So rain or shine, you, the, the two that are leaning up against the little pile right there, Okay. those are... Let's see if I can do this without losing a finger. <laughs> Whoa! Can you smell the inside of that? Oh yeah. It's got a little bit of turpentine. They also call it that cracker incense. Cracker incense. <laughs> wow, that's yeah. I love that. Thank you. Oh wow. This right here really smells. Can you smell it? Yeah. What is that? It's what we call the lighter, the fat lighter. It's the bowl that's the center of the pine tree. And it's got turpentine. Yeah, that's the turpentine smell. But they would cut the top of this off and then light it. Yeah, and that's what you're going to think about it. It looks like it's just. Oh my god, it looks like you can do it with the light. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a hell Yeah. That's a weapon. Okay, hi, I'm Guy Bachman with the Loxahatchee Battle Feud Preservation Group. We're a nonprofit group in Jupiter, Florida. We're, we're dedicated to education and preservation of a 5,000 year old ancient Indian occupation site along the Loxahatchee River. And two major battles from the Second Seminole War from 1835 to 1842. It, it was the longest and most expensive Indian war ever. American history cost over $30 million dollars the money at that time. We are here with General Thomas Sidney Jessup, who was on the establishment of Fort Pierce back in 1838. After they established this fort, just a couple of weeks later, the soldiers went to the south and engaged the Seminole Indians of right along the Jupiter Inlet and the Loxahatchee River in two major battles. And the second battle was the largest battle of that war with over 1,600 soldiers against 2 or 300 red, black, Seminoles. The black Seminoles were state slaves who fought alongside of the Seminole Indians. And they both have something in common. They're fighting for their freedom. And General Jessup was at the second battle where he had a problem with wood. Oh, General Jessup, you're on TV right now. You Oh, and she would like to know about your confrontation with William Lauderdale at the Battle of the Loxahatchee. Yeah. Turns out that the, uh, the confrontation with General or with uh, Major Lauderdale was because uh, I wanted the Tennessee Volunteers to be the first ones to go across the Loxahatchee River and uh, battle the Seminoles and uh, Major Lauderdale refused to go. Uh, and uh, the reason was that uh, two weeks before the Battle of uh, Okeechobee, the 
Missouri volunteers had gone in first and they took a lot of casualties. So, uh, Lauderdale didn't want his men to uh, get several of the casualties and so he refused to go, but uh, I put a pistol up to his head and said, he will go across. And he says, yeah. so what difference does it make whether uh, you shoot me here or I get shot going across that river, I'm going to die anyway. I was like, go ahead and shoot. But he knew that uh, he had his back covered back in Washington, D.C. because uh, Lauderdale fought in the Battle of New Orleans for Major General Andrew Jackson. And uh, Andrew Jackson used to be a Tennessee volunteer, which is what Lauderdale was. And uh, the Jacksons and Lauderdales used to be neighbors back in Tennessee. So he knew the uh, President of the United, the one who had been uh, President of the United States for the past eight years. So he was able to get away with that uh, only because he was politically uh, uh, covered in Washington, D.C. So Jesuit went ahead and ordered his men to follow him, and he led them across. The only thing was that Jesuit got shot as he was going across and uh, just hit in the cheek but uh, knocked his glasses off, and when he went to pick up his glasses and turned around, nobody was following <laughs> So that was, that was a Lauderdale incident. <laughs> we still ended up winning the battle, but it, uh, it was for other reasons, not the Tennessee Volunteers in Paris. And I'm sorry. No, that's okay. That I want to make sure that I get that book hey, in there, that too. That was done by the most famous military artist in America. His works are hanging up in Washington, D.C. And this is the, it's called the confrontation or the incident. And that's what Dick was talking about, where he's threatening Major William Lauderdale. Of course, they named a fort after him, Fort Lauderdale. Hey, it's a real story. It was only discovered four years ago because they tried to cover it up in the military. <laughs> we got a letter. You want me to tell the story about yeah, the letter? Please, yeah. Okay, Guy Bachman here again. On four years ago, our group received a letter from a dealer in antiquities, and he had an eyewitness account of the confrontation between General Jessup and William Lauderdale. Now, in history, we always wondered why a general of the theater of war would lead the attack himself. It was very rare. As a matter of fact, it never happened. And now we know why, because according to the captain who was at the battle back in 1838, again, there was a confrontation Major William Lauderdale refused to lead his men across the river because he was a Tennessee volunteer. He felt for the safety of his boys. He knew what happened at the Battle of Okeechobee about a month earlier where they shot all the Missouri volunteers up front. He thought it was unsafe, yet he disobeyed a direct order in battle. And Jessup had a right to shoot him. Why he didn't shoot him is because Lauderdale was personal friends and neighbors of Andrew Jackson, so he was a connected guy, and according to this letter, General Jessup said, either you lead your men across this river or I'll blow your blanking brains out, but he was intractable, he still refused to do it because he knew he was friends of Jackson, he knew Jessup was not going to shoot him, Jessup being furious, said, okay, I fired Lauderdale, you Tennessee volunteers. You follow your general and you follow me across the river. And as he pulled out his sword and he, he walked down to the river, he turns around and nobody is following him. He's all by himself. And he shot, oh, he shot in the eye by the Indians. He shot right in the glass and then knocked the glasses off. Now, this was only discovered on four years ago. And we, we always, now we know why the general led the attack himself across the Loxahatchee River. It was a military cover-up, and, and, and General didn't want to admit he threatened the life of Major Lauderdale. And Major Lauderdale, on his report, he didn't want to admit that he, he disobeyed the direct order in combat. Right. So they tried to play it down, but again, on four years ago, this captain who was at the battle, 
He gave us this letter and explains the truth of the battle and the truth of the confrontation or the incident, as it is called, at the Battle of the Waxahachie that faded away into history, recently been discovered only four years ago. Isn't that It's great. always nice to know the truth. It is. <laughs> Sometimes That's it's hard wonderful. to find the truth. Yeah, but in this case, we know it now. That's and awesome. And I just Thank want to you. tell you that this Jackson Walker is the foremost military artist. His works are hanging up on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. And he's doing a second painting here on the right, and that is a sketch of a major battle of the Loxahatchee, which had 1,600 soldiers and 300 red and black Seminoles. And this is his first painting, is owned by, eventually this will appear in the museum or an interpretive center. And that is our goal, to have an interpretive center on the battlefield. One of our members owns this painting right now. And the second one is in the process right here, right Mr. Oh, Reese nice. King is in front of that. And that is a sketch. So, you know, we are blessed to have a great artist who recaptured the battle of the Loxahatchee. That's wonderful. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.